Um, so without further ado, um, this, uh, uh, is, this particular webinar is, is uh, going to focus particularly on circular business models and circular design related to fishing gear. A little bit about me um, before we start. I have a background in business and sustainability since the late 80s and prior to that in various other sectors. I've worked in startups, uh, large and small companies and, and the last 25 years have really been focusing on products and sustainability. Um, range of books in the past, please could everybody remain muted? That would be great so we don't pick up on background noise. So just a few books over the years and, and latterly a book around designing for the circular economy. It's enough about me. So um, and what I should mention is there will be opp opportunities to add questions and, and uh, observations in the chat um, box that I will pick up at different points during the session. So we have opportunities um, to pick that up during the session at the end. So. As I mentioned at the start, this uh, is, uh, is brought to you by, uh, this webinar is brought to you by the Blue Circular Economy Project. That's a, a European Interreg funded project uh, focused on the NPA region. And this follows up the very successful Circular Ocean Project that ran between 2015 and 2018. And the project is particularly focused on the northern periphery area you know, the north of Europe, uh, but these webinars are open to all. The project itself um, has various deliverables, including developing clusters around circular fishing gear, uh, also working with SMEs on looking at uh, opportunities and also looking at, uh, uh, you know, the ideas of some sort of product related information. And again, please, uh, people, um, uh, email me at the end if you're interested in more information. Uh, and as I mentioned, this, this uh, webinar is based on a report that we recently published. So uh, going a little bit big picture before we focus in on the sector. Um, so, you know, the sustainable development agenda has been recalibrated, if you like, in 2005 with the launch of the uh, sustainable development goals and uh, you know these SDGs you know are, are covering a broader issue than circular economy. Circular economy in my perspective fits within sustainable development and touches on a number of the goals, a number of goals particularly in relation to, to uh, fishing gear in relation to SDG 14 and SDG uh, 12. Where did the circular economy discussion arise from? Well, it started to sort of gain greater, uh, you know, uh, clarity as, as a topic after the 2008, when there became increasing questions over the sort of moving away from this so-called take, make, dispose economy to a more circular economy where value in products, materials and, and components circulates more effectively in economic and social systems. And this area, you know, uh, in, in the background thinking focuses on products that fit within the, the bio, in, in, a, in a broad sense, the bio product area. Please could everybody remain muted? Uh, and in the technical area. And, and primarily for fishing gear, you know, we're sitting in the technical area uh, because of, of the shift in the 50s and 60s to polymers. We've, we really started to see the growth in the terms circular economy uh, over the last sort of, uh, you know, eight to 10 years, particularly, uh, and this is taken from Google Trends about people searching on the term. And one of the key issues that people often ask is what do we mean by circular economy? And this <laughs> issue has now, please could everybody remain muted, uh, has, uh, now led to the development of a new ISO technical committee to address the issue of circular economy. And uh, this, this new te technical committee has now, are now in the process of moving forward uh, uh, four standards. Uh, and these were just recently balloted and there was an agreement to move forward. So those four standards include 
uh, one on terms and definitions, one on circular business one on models, and one on uh, measuring circularity. And this is this is at a high level. This isn't specifically for this sector. And what we've seen at various countries at a national level, there have been various guidance standards. Uh, this is BS 8001 that I participated in the UK. It was around implementing circular economy in organisations. And one of the issues that emerged from that was this challenge over the terminology. Many different uh, terms associated with circular economy and often in, in standardization, and I've been involved in standardization for about 20 years, in standards you often cut down the, uh, the terminology and standards uh, section uh, to key topics. But what it was felt by industry particularly was to keep uh, a long list of the terms and definitions. European Commission started to move forward with its thinking uh, in this area, you know, uh, and developed, if you like, the Circular Economy Action Plan 1.0, the first one in December 2015. And really this, you know, took forward traditional areas that we would see here on the left, but it led to a more of a, of a product and materials focus. And particularly what evolved from uh, this uh, Circular Economy Action Plan 1.0 was is a particular um, growing um, interest and concern around the, the, the plastic sector. And um, what in effect uh, this then led to was the single use plastics directive uh, that was uh, uh, effectively announced and then, and then uh, passed in the summer last year. And within the single use plastics directive, there are, you know, uh, you know, requirements at a member state level to start put in place extended producer responsibility schemes for, for fishing gear, targeted with the responsibility being at the producers and assemblers. And this builds on, you know, uh, you know, legislation and, and thinking in, in the commission that have been used in terms of EPR and electronics, packaging and automotive. And the schedule going forward, you know, is uh, that, uh, uh, that by the end of 2022, um, you know, uh, member states, as far as I understand it, need to collect data on fishing gear uh, that is placed on the market. And then there will be a reporting period, um, something like 18 months after this. And then by the end of uh, 2024, um, EPR schemes will need to be established. Now, uh, 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 you know, so uh, this this is my understanding at, at present. But uh, you know, I, I'm I'm happy to have uh, more updated information provided to me. So, and my understanding again is that in 2027 um, there will be a potential evaluation of the single-use plastics directive and the EPR mm -hmm. schemes for nets within it, um, where the you know EC may propose binding targets. What the Circular Economy Action Plan uh, 1.0 also put in place was a request to develop a proposal for European standards around the circular design of fishing gear, and that it has and is being progressed through a series of workshops and discussions with industry and other stakeholders. And again, my understanding is that the standardization process then is slated to start at some stage in 2021. So the latest Circular Economy uh, 2.0 uh, was recently published. And please, uh, please could people remain muted because um, we pick up on background noise. So the latest, uh, if you like, the Circular Economy 2.0 uh, uh, you know, was published in March and this has brought in also a broader, um, you know, interest in sustainable product policy um, uh, beyond the traditional sectors. And, it, and is also, for example, a reinforced the interest in the area of plastics. And plastics really has become a significantly higher profile issue over the last sort of five to eight years, particularly, you know, with the raising of awareness of marine litter through a range of documentaries, including the Blue Planet series, um, you know, that's really brought some of these pictures uh, to our screens um, and the impacting on, 
you know, uh, marine mammals, birds, but also economically as well. So focusing in on the topic of fishing gear, very complex set of products, many types of products um, for the many types of fish that are collected or that are fished, if you like, across, across Europe at, at different depths and of different sizes. So we often end up talking about fishing nets, but also, of course, there is, you know, it's finfish and shellfish, and it's also aquaculture um, as well as in a sense conventional types of fishing and fishing gear includes nets ropes components and peripherals all sorts of materials and indeed plastics global at a workshop highlighted there may be up to um, 700 plus combinations and permutations of materials in fishing gear and of course when people are designing fishing gear um, or when net manufacturers designers and assemblers are you know you know designing fishing gear they need to think about the functionality of the product uh, right at the top it's got to be able to catch fish fin or shell costs the materials the durability and also we found in our research that there is a lot of customization that goes on between fishing operators and the producers um, so they're very customized products. Um, uh, they're also, the, the designers and developers need to think about failure modes. Where is it that the products fail, they, you know, tearing, you know, et cetera. But also as we found in the research, there is a lot of assembly of fishing gear in Europe. A big issue is there it is the supply chains, particularly into Asia in terms of the polymers. So again, complex sets of products um, that include different types of components and we found I only found this as someone relatively new to the sector when we disassembled uh, some fishing nets in a hackathon process we ran so uh, but it's not just you know um, the fin fish um, and please could everybody remain uh, muted that'd be great uh, it's also shellfish and also uh, you know aquaculture gear Again, please could people remain muted. So what we're finding is that there's generally, uh, you know, the, 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 the nets are made from polypropylene, uh, polyethylene and, and nylon. And, and, and often at the end of life, uh, the nets are going to landfill and even in Europe can be incinerated, uh, but still uh, a proportion of the nets are going into the, the sea. But on the other side of it, what we see is the strong repair and modification culture by fishing operators. Um, and even we found very specific terminology such as splicing, where, you know, uh, you know, uh, torn parts of nets are replaced uh, with other pieces of, of, of web uh, and then in effect are sewn into or patched into the net. And, and this is where you see the different colors in the nets. Uh, they're an indicator the net has been uh, in effect modified and repaired. But what we found also in our initial study within the circulation project uh, where we looked at what was going on in Ireland, in Scotland, in Norway and Greenland was a very fragmented approach at a, at a port level, at a region level and national level. Different waste management practices, uh, different you know approaches at the policy level etc et and a key issue within this is that, um, that we have big problems in measuring the extent of uh, the waste fishing gear issue there in 2009 the United Nations developed a study that came up with the figures highlighted the 640,000 tons of nets and ropes going to the sea each year that represented approximately 10% of all ocean marine plastics. And this study is often repeated and has been repeated very recently by Greenpeace. However, analysis in our Circular Ocean project um, made it clear there were a lot of assumptions to this study. What we now see is that the Commission is using a figure of about 27 to 28% of all ocean marine plastics. And there are other studies that are indicating uh, by weight that fishing gear may be up to 70 odd percent. 
But the key issue here is we still don't have reliable figures at a poor region or national or global level. So it's a classic management problem. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So, you know, there's a need to collect that data to find out uh, what the extent of the, the issues are and really develop baselines, um, you know, as to where we are now. So effectively, at the moment, we're facing a design problem, both at the sense of the design and development of the nets, but also the services to support Please, could people remain muted? Um, nee, that is, that please, that, could that, people remain muted? Please, could people remain muted? Please, could people remain muted? Please, could people remain muted? Right, so uh, there's a design problem. So, uh, so we're facing this challenge um, of uh, this at the end of life. Um, often, you know, both uh, also stored waste in ports. And, and maybe we sh should be moving into this design problem to, to you know, a, a, a better organization of the system. But re really, you know, these issues are, you know, uh, you know, relatively new issue for the sector. And one needs to build the capacity both in terms of knowledge, skills, and the ability to do these uh, things. So there needs to be new infrastructure, new training, etc. Do we have any questions at this stage or any observations? And please could you put them in a the chat box? If I don't see any, there is an opportunity to put other questions in the chat box um, as we move further on. And as I'm not seeing anything right now, I will move on. So um, if we're thinking about circularity in terms of fishing gear, you know, there are various opportunities to increase the product longevity of, of, of the product through, you know, various strategies. And uh, what we've identified in the project to date is a series of uh, uh, what I call uh, opportunity zones, you know, from the commercial side, you know, you know, there are existing players who are repairing nets and, and generating income. You know, there are companies reusing the nets into other products, but also reusing the nets in, in other countries. There is a, a, there's a few specific companies, for example, providing reverse logistics services in, in, the, in the space. And there are uh, two uh, recyclers, um, Plastics Global in mechanical recycling, and, and aquafil in chemical recycling, although there are, another, are a number of others who are uh, you know, moving into the area. There's also a number of others who are making products and some are trying to experiment with looking at solutions to take um, you know, the polymers back down to the base oil. Key issue is 80% of a product's environmental impact is determined at the design stage. So if one's not thinking about it at the design and the development stage, one's potentially building in challenges and issues. And really what we see at the moment is relatively few uh, approaches going on where uh, uh, manufacturers and assemblers of, of, of the gear are, are providing closed loop solutions. We are aware that they, it is happening. So some offer a service to take back and repair and resupply the net. But most of what we've seen so far is in the so-called open loop that is outside the system. And still at this stage, there are relatively few products in the world that have been uh, made from fishing gear in, in, in another form. So there are reuse models. This is Verdura who are producing uh, shoes from the fishing gear and selling these shoes. When I interviewed them, they, they mentioned for about 250 euros. So I'll leave you as to whether you would want to buy those products. You've also got Bracenet who are reusing, uh, you know, the, uh, the ropes into jewelry. Then you've got, it's sort of, it's chemical recycling, but it's also sort of a regeneration process. Aquafil have developed this eco-nile process to de and repolymerize nylon uh, nets into second life fibers, but they then supply 
going into the textiles and clothing sector, socks, swimwear, but also into the carpet sector. But, you know, the other side of this, whilst that is very positive, this is a chemicals recycling process. And I, I guess the other issues in a broader environmental perspective are, you know, how are the, the chemicals used, uh, you know, are disposed of in the process. We have mechanical recycling and particularly well known in this area is Plastics Global in Denmark. And, uh, you know, there is the pelletization of the products that have been, the pellets are then being sold on to other companies. And I believe that uh, plastics are now showcasing some products made from the pellets. And also you have some other companies that are injection molding using the pellets and notably Burio, um, who have got an injection molding system themselves and they are producing, yeah. uh, for example, skateboards um, and uh, a range of other products. There's also one commercial company, there may be others, um, that is uh, producing filament for 3D printing. So the business is producing the filament for 3D printing. So they sell the filament onto those that will manufacture products using uh, filaments. And this is the company called Fishy Filament in the southwest of the UK. So in thinking about designing for the circular economy, it's reframing the, the thinking from thinking about um, towards thinking about how we maximize value uh, in products, materials and components in economic and social systems for as long as possible. And moving away from thinking about waste. So it's about moving from this to this and it's about an extended life cycle perspective with more focus on the use phase. So, you know, how we get the products back, how we repair them, you know, how we extend the life, you know, uh, looking at things like designing more proactively for, to enable this. So any question? I see there's two questions if I can get to them. So John, ISFPO is the only participant not muted okay thank you um i'm having to juggle between various things so so uh thank you for letting me know there i think it's all quiet on the western front there so amanda thanks for a great deal of useful information are you aware of any gear suppliers following the rental model for greater circularity no i no i'm not at the moment i'm very interested to hear of uh, of such new business models and i'll mention that in later on in terms of you know, ideas about leasing and rental um, and, and more sharing models. So if anybody has examples of that, uh, that that is being offered, I'm very interested to hear that. So if there isn't any other questions or observations at this point, I will continue. And again, there will be opportunities to ask more questions. So I've just seen one crop up here very quickly. Um, so, um, Okay, so great. Um, all, all fine on the Western Front. Next thing is we get the technology working in. So again, um, thinking about this issue um, of circular design and, and the, the potential launch of this standard next year, um, you know, it's a little bit more background on eco-design and, and circular design. So eco-design is this is the systematic approach is uh, which considers environmental aspects in design and development with the aim of reducing adverse environmental impacts throughout the life cycle of the product and and this is an identical definition into standards that have recently been launched the term eco design is predominantly used in europe but there are other terms for the same process they used in different parts of the world so eco-design has been practiced for over 20 years in different sectors, for example, electronics, automotive, but it, it appears to be a new issue for the for fishing gear design and development processes. The principles and, and many tools have been developed covering eco-design over the last 20 years, and a number of these uh, tools take account of circularity aspects. And this is becoming are uh, more important um, as, as an issue in, in, in the, the European Commission to further developing its circular 
uh, economy policy at a product level to go beyond uh, energy focus to also starting to look at materials efficiency. And materials, you know, sufficient gear is different, obviously, from electronics, whereas, for example, a computer, the biggest environmental impact is the electricity used in the use phase of the product, whereas fishing gear is more materials based. So, as I mentioned here, you know, to date, um, you know, I'm still exploring and looking for examples of the proactive incorporation of environmental considerations of, uh, of environmental considerations into the design and development. And I'm very much welcome examples of, of that um, if they are there. So it's important within in eco design to, to take this life cycle perspective and to consider the whole life cycle. And again, from training that I've done, particularly in the B2B area in Asia, you know, in companies that are that not necessarily in this space, but in, in other sectors, you often find with companies that are new to eco design, they simply sell the product to the customer, particularly B2B, and you know, in a sense, the story's over. They have no idea where the product ends up at the end of life because they have no, they have not need to think about it. So I think this is perhaps an issue that we see in this sector, which isn't necessarily uncommon in other sectors. Uh, at present, product circularity is very much focused on the repair and modification of the fishing gear in the use phase of the product. So this is really the fishing operators sweating their own assets. And, and they, they do that, you know, obviously because fishing gear in our research can cost up to, you know, 200,000 euros in some instances and, and possibly more. So it's an expensive product. So there is a need to sweat that asset. So that said, there are horizontal eco design standards that now exist that are, uh, have been designed for all products or sectors that may be useful. And indeed, in reinforcing this, there's a key issue within, e within eco design going back to that definition to think about how we reduce environmental impacts across the life cycle, and particularly within bringing in circularity, it's, it's a matter of thinking about particularly the use phase of the product with the, with the fishing operators. How could we enable the fishing operators to extend the life of the products even more and uh, reduce some of the design problems, the waste to landfill, uh, the waste to sea, the incineration, etc. And again, Thinking about this very broadly, you know, what could gear manufacturers and assemblers do? Well, you know, thinking about resource depletions, you know, circular economy within the product development process, they could think about various environmental issues that impact on the development of gear, you know, you know, energy, etc. But also particularly thinking about materials content and amount, um, you know, because so this is, is, is the key issue to some extent within the gear development could start to think about in the design and development process is what options are there to start to uh, you know make the product uh, more circular for example looking at the, the weight the volume you know how uh, products could be light weighted reducing the number of parts you know uh, changing the mix of materials so those design and developers and I understand it one of the terms that is used is gear technologists I need to be thinking about you know materials energy etc throughout the life cycle and those standards at the moment as I mentioned they go back some time um, so the first eco design standard and these are all guidance standards these are not for certification so they're all guidance standards but the first uh, eco design standard goes back to 2002 and and all of these standards I have been involved in and um, you know the uh, the latest standard in 2020 um, was published you know uh, in February and this is um, provides guidance on how companies can include eco design in their environmental management systems and their quality systems and this is very much targeted management systems rather than the design side Within the IC side, um, there was a joint standard between the IC and ISO that built on an existing electronic standard that uh, was broadened to all products and all sectors. So this is 
probably more, more um, useful potentially to the sector in the sense that this has provided operational guidance to designers and developers as to how to implement eco design at that design level. And that standard was published uh, you know, at the back end of last year. So I see there's a couple of questions here in the chat box. And please, can you remain muted? Um, so, uh, a deep, great deal of useful information. Are you aware of any gear, uh, rental models that I've got there? Gear, gear supplied to boats are tailored to suit the horsepower and gross tons. So the majority is one off. There, there isn't 700 different combinations of fishing gear. There is less than 100. Um, the figure I quoted, and sorry, please can everybody remain muted just for the, the, the purposes of the webinar, is this was a figure quoted by Plastics Global, who are one of the main, or if the main, not the main mechanical recycler. So it'd be good to know the source of that material because we're always looking for good quality uh, material, you know, data on this thing. This was... Uh, uh, mentioned several times in a workshop 700 not the combinations of gear but that that's you know that that's correct Maris it's not the gear itself it's the materials used in the uh, there's seven uh, what was quoted by plastics global is there were 700 combinations and permutations of materials used in fishing gear sorry if I did not make that clear Net, so from Catherine, net design would include and, and conduct eco design, refuel, life cycle extension. Now a new eco. Uh, whoever has mentioned at the top of the presentation, presentation, there is a critical need to address the fragmentation of the journey. So, so absolutely, uh, this this is a broader set of issues. Um, you know, they're coming through, particularly the uh, the circular design standard. That is, this has been slated for next year's. Absolutely, huge issue of this fragmentation. Uh, there is very, there isn't really a common view on a lot of these issues, and we've got a very fragmented picture on data and, and information and, and and many different perspectives on issues. So, absolutely, I uh, agree with you, Catherine, and and uh, you know that was also reinforced by Maris. So. Uh, please keep those points coming in and I'll, I'll try and get the technology moving on to the next phase. Um, so um, thinking now about business models and, and so this, this is just, you know, putting out ideas, you know, so this is thinking about business model and a business model describes the rationale of how an organization creates, delivers and captures value. And so it's very much about the business and its value creation. And there are various models and tools to do this. So thinking about more circular models for fishing gear, assemblers uh, and, many, and uh, manufacturers, you know, some ideas that are more detailed uh, and fleshed out in the report might be, you know, could there be, uh, you know, more uh, on de demand um, production of, fishing gear in local communities, perhaps using 3D printing or, added, and, and, or additive manufacturing, where they produce much more closely and quickly to the need of the, of the, of the, fish, the fishing operators, and maybe also 3D printing of, of components or, uh, you know, or sub-assemblies um, or, or, or modules even. So could that be a new, opp new opportunity? And maybe this also could make the process uh, potentially more, uh, you know, uh, reduce waste in the, in the byproduct side of manufacturing. There are various reuse business options. So if, if thinking about a fishing gear manufacturer and assembler, you know, if it in integrated circularity into its core business model, you know, could design for modularity be built into the production of all the, the nets and the nets being generally customized for the users. So as was highlighted earlier, what we've, what we've found and I think reinforced in the comments is often the products are one off. And this is a, another part of the, uh, the complexity of this is that uh, very closely designed to the, to the needs and, and interests and, and techniques of the fishermen. So could we build in 
you know, modularity, etc. Could we also think about remanufacturing systems for fishing nets? I don't know, again, whether this is feasible. I'm just putting this out as an idea. You know, this idea of bringing nets back and not just, uh, you know, repairing certain modules or sections of the net, but fully um, bringing the product back up to life, uh, perhaps replacing larger elements of the net with maybe econile products, for example, or twine, for example. So is there a way to take larger scale the nets back and bring it back up to its first life? Also thinking about uh, product service systems. So, you know, thinking about delivering the function of the net rather than the product itself. So, you know, thinking about what is the function of fishing gear, you know, i.e. to perhaps uh, as efficiently, you know, uh, and cost effective and resource efficiently to, to collect fish or shellfish and fin fish. So thinking about the function of nets and, uh, you know, starting to say, uh, you know, rather than um, supplying the product, could we lease or rent that, that net? Or could we actually, you know, del you know, deliver a service where you're paying for the function rather than the physical net. So as I mentioned, I believe that some net um, manufacturers are offering um, some take back options. And then there's also perhaps a social innovation model in smaller fishing communities where there could be, you know, shared uh, net options amongst cooperatives uh, where you know, nets are, are rented out or shared. Maybe it's an ownership by a community of certain nets, and then and there's an organised system to use those nets depending on the needs of 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 the of the community. So those are just some ideas floated out there, and just uh, moving into the the last sections. So again, how do we move from this design problem to this design opportunity? And one of the things that we can start to think about at a port uh, city area is to start to look at could we design more effective you know um, systems within the port areas and in, within the regions to try and uh, you know move that problem you know to, to a solution so bringing in the different stakeholders in the innovation system um, to actually start to address the problem. So one of those key parts of this is to bring different core groups together in different ways maybe. And we developed a methodology that, to tackle this, to bring um, you know, people from innovation business systems in port areas with uh, role players and stakeholders in the fishing system. And indeed, <sighs> Uh, we organized two workshops to, to, to implement this methodology where we effectively invited key players in, in the, business, the innovation and the fishing systems to two workshops in Alison in, in Norway and then in Galway in Ireland. And we respectively um, uh, had 35, around 35 and 45 delegates. Um, and really what Absolutely, the strongest output from those workshops was that great opportunity to network between uh, stakeholders who had never met before. And uh, this, this was the, 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 um, the prime uh, benefit that was seen by the, uh, by, the, by the workshops. What we also did was to test the idea of uh, a lab. Again, this is a concept. Um, that we, we tested with the group where we found some interest, not universal interest, but, but some interest. And this is the idea of, of thinking about in that port city area, could you organize the systems to collect, you know, the nets to sort, to process, to manufacture and market, particularly thinking about uh, products derived from those fishing gear. You know, and this would be a physical space um, that, that might have different modules or components within it or different you know these might be on different floors in a building they might be different parts of a of a city or even a region you know one part of this could be a design lab coming up with looking at ideas and developing the more 
creative part to develop products, then a processing lab to pro process, you know, the the the, uh, the 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 gear, the waste gear, into maybe filaments or pellets, then a manufacturing assembly lab, and maybe a lab for startup companies. This would be small scale because one of the issues again that came up from the particularly the Galway workshop was this issue of you know predicting the volume of the material so these four components could come together in one place but they might be separate and it could be a way to you know develop particularly post cv19 you know an, an opportunity to develop products to develop businesses to create jobs particularly you know to assess you know there are the challenges that will be associated with um, the extended producer responsibility, uh, um, you know, legislation coming up in the next few years, but there are there are going to be opportunities there in terms of, uh, you know, the the infrastructure to enable this to happen. But you know, almost as we we say say this as an idea, we found an example of something similar starting to happen. So in Sotanus in Sweden they've taken the concept of industrial symbiosis into an innovation lab to look at the issues associated with uh, the marine and sea sector. And this particular region in Sweden uh, is, 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 you know, has a strong fish processing sector and also a land-based aquaculture sector and is the home to many seafood um, suppliers. And they've really mapped out um, you know the the ecosystem uh, within the region and 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 the city area, and and they particularly focused on uh, marine recycling, and have very much started to explore in practice some of these issues about um, you know following that value chain approach. So again, you know this seems to be a very interesting project, and I hope to visit it at some stage once we come out of lockdown. So thinking to the future, you know, we have a design problem at the moment. So, you know, there, there is fishing gear that is going to landfill. There is fishing gear that's going to the oceans. There is fishing gear that is being uh, incinerated in, in Europe. You know, how do we move to a more organized system? Um, you know, particularly given that we are moving towards extended producer responsibility schemes across Europe over the next four or five years and remembering particularly at the gear design and development stage that 80 percent of a product's environmental impact is determined at the design side, side, side stage so how do we train our gear technologists in these areas to, to start to more proactively build you know repair you know product longevity uh, durability etc cetera, etc cetera into the design process um, you know this is this is the book i did please feel to to, to buy it uh, hopefully it'd be very useful sorry commercial plug there so uh, uh, i see there's a last couple of questions and if people um, wish to um, send any questions please uh, feel free to do that so i'm just fielding the questions here if i can um, so um, um, so there's a question from Falk. Um, can you expand on the EPR scheme for fishing gear? How would this look like? Are there disadvantages? I can't really expand on this at the moment because this is, uh, you know, in, in the legislative development process. I would just look at the single use plastics directive, find that, I, I, you know, I think you can find that online and that will spell out, um, uh, you know, the legal aspects of the extended producer responsibility you'll find some of some of that a pricey of some of that in in the in the, the research study by rental model and this is from amanda we we can think of a product as a service so can there still be customization for each particular customer but the owners moves from a manufacturer manufacturer to ensure nets are suitable for long life but absolutely and we can look at the whole product service system model that is the unit is that is that is out there you know it's about supplying 
you know, the service and paying for the service rather than the physical product. So it may be that you've got a, a leasing or rental model where you've subscribed to the nets. So you pay a monthly cash flow amount rather than the physical outright buying of, of products. And you've particularly seen this model um, exercised in, in totally other sectors like the photocopier sector where, you know, photo, photo, you pay, uh, you know, uh, through the use of the photocopier and, and those photocopiers are supplied usually on a, on a leasing model where at certain stages they go back, they go back, they're upgraded and repaired and then it taken back to the product, so, uh, to the customer. So it is absolutely part of the product service system model is you have to remain, you, you get closer to your customer. Please take into consideration, this is from uh, uh, Vim, uh, please take into consideration most nets are made within a family fishing company. So a rental model is far more expensive by definition as in the family group, the work of a retired fisherman is for free or almost for free as, as for EPR. The, the Icelandic model with voluntary, uh, with a voluntary but compulsive system within the industry seems to be low cost and very effective. A financial EPR system in, in this relatively small sector may prove to have uh, extremely high overhead. So, um, so yes, point taken uh, there, you know, that we also found that, um, if I remember rightly, that um, in effect, nets can be actually produced by fishing, fishermen and fishing operators, but they're excluded uh, from uh, the directive um, as such. But yes, the information- Guys, I'm supposed to be on another call. Oh, sorry, sorry, can you remain muted, whoever that was? Um, so yes, uh, point taken. So I'm, I'm aware that uh, you know Iceland has has a has a, 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 a model that has been in place, and we all need to learn from that. And and I hope uh, that we can get the best practice from. There's another call I was supposed to be on. I've had to start it so, to sorry, show them can, there. Can somebody remain muted? Sorry. sorry, somebody's unmuted here. Um, and there's so basically there is there, there are examples from from iceland um and and yes there's a need to look at obviously best practice uh, and where that is and learn from that absolutely um fishing nets are constantly being repaired and reused and this is from rodney uh some nets are over 20 years old yes constantly putting new materials in to keep the nets new and usable if a lost net is found and is feasible to where it's repaired it's all go to do all to do with cost all fishing nets are designed easily to be repaired so absolutely is you know as i found and i stated earlier we found this repair and, and uh, modification over there what we haven't found and haven't found any case studies is the proactive design of fishing gear to do that if there are proactive case studies of companies doing that that are that are you prepared to put into the public domain i think a number of us are very keen to see that this. So if, if this is, you know, as you say, is happening, please share examples uh, because we're all keen to learn from that approach. Um, apologies everyone, uh, but the continent is one hour ahead in time and we must leave by him. Um, thanks Martin for an interesting presentation. I have to leave now, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, so, uh, thank you all. Is there any uh, questions? Um, and I think you can either put that in the chat box or if you want to ask something um, in person, if it's short, um, happy to take, take that um, and just to unmute yourself. So whichever way, got a couple more minutes, um, I think. Uh, so uh, if anybody wants to make an observation, ask a question, either in the chat box or verbally, uh, please feel free to do that. Um, if, um, if there are any other comments, I'd be interested in key things. I'm always interested in one key thing that people found very interesting from the, from the workshop or the webinar or one key thing that was omitted or wasn't correct. 
Uh, so very interested in any feedback if anybody's prepared to share that. Um, so any questions, any thoughts, any observations, feedback, you know, anything you found really useful, anything that's, that's, that was missing. Um, so, uh, so Jasper here, um, I know fish, fishermen change nets when they feel it is 95% effective. Others keep nets for a year. Yeah, I think the whole pattern, um, you know, of uh, the uh, use of nets is perhaps not well researched. It's maybe understood by people in the sector, but I think this is, needs to be better understood. Uh, and, you know, um, uh, I, I'm sure that could be correct. I'm certainly aware and have seen through the Global Ghost Gear Initiative that I sit on the advisory board, there are some nets, I think, in Asia that are almost uh, designed to be very cheap for one-time usage. So they almost are used once and then effectively they become microplastics or they break. And that's purely, you know, you know, for cost purposes, very cheap. So Maeve, given how expensive fishing nets are, it seems unlike the fishermen are just dumping at the end of life. Any ideas where ghost gear is originating from? So, you know, that's what I would have thought as well, but it's happening. You know, uh, there is, you know, significant problems with, with ghost gear, uh, significant volumes in the sea. Um, there is you know, significant volumes um, of, of waste fishing gear. For example, in Greenham, huge landfill sites because there isn't cost-effective recycling facilities in, in Greenland. So, uh, you know, I, I, in terms of getting in more detail into the source of the ghost gear on a global basis, you know, uh, there's uh, studies that I think, in, this is in global terms relatively, there's a lot of uh, problems occurring in countries that have not well, such well developed waste management systems such as China, Thailand, India, etc. But I would uh, please um, email the Global Ghost Gear Initiative on this. Lots of great links to legislation coming down the, down the pipe from Amanda. There's an incentive to get ahead. What measures of a product circularity are available? Um, well, I would suggest you read the report. I've tried to spell it out there. Um, and I think there are various opportunities. I think, you know, uh, there may be uh, things that we haven't seen yet in terms of the design of fishing gear that is already happening, but not in the public domain. Um, from um, our side, we, we haven't seen that proactive design for repair, modularity, remanufacturability. We've seen that repair really going on within the fishing systems themselves. Um, there may be, um, uh, it may be built into the dialogue between the fishermen and the, 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 the fishing uh, producers and the assemblers, but there hasn't been any direct reports that have covered this that I'm aware of. And I think a number of us would be really interested in, in that. Um, so Jago says gear gets lost during fishing operation storms. They can also get stuck in rocky bottoms. So, so absolutely there is a whole series of uh, reasons in a sense why, why, why the, the, the gear ends up in the sea. We've also come to come across competition where some operators will cut other people's nets, as you say, will be snagged, you know, et cetera. All, all of the things that can also get snagged in, you know, uh, you know, propellers, et cetera. So there are uh, a whole series of reasons and I, I would uh, suggest you um, go into the Global Ghost Gear Initiative's website where they document this. Again, we've still got some opportunities for some questions or observations. And I see from Fander, can you tell us more about the plastics type uh, type of nets that are most recycled, mechanically and chemically? Most ghost gear found in Minyamar, and I see most, you know, ghost, uh, most of the uh, Southeast Asia is gill nets. So, yes, my understanding is most 
uh, Goski is Gilnets, and my understanding that uh, the nets that are being recycled by aquafil into the Econile fibers are only nylon. I am not a hundred percent certain uh, with Plastics Global because I've had, uh, you know, in terms of mechanical recycling, because I think I've had some, uh, you know, different information in workshops. Um, and my understanding is that they can. Uh, they claim they can recycle a number of different polymers. So I would suggest you go back directly to uh, Plastics Global on that. Um, but also, you know, different types of nets are made out of different types of polymers based on, the, uh, on their function and whether they are, for example, bottom trawling or, you know, uh, you know pelagic or whatever. So much depends on the function and the type of net that is being uh, collected. So often in the past, you know, people haven't asked about the polymers because they'd be more interested with the function. So any further questions, observations, any one or two, one thing that you liked, one thing you found really interesting, one thing that you, you thought was should be improved, um, you know, uh, would be very much welcomed. Um, so, any further questions or thoughts, either in the chat or verbally? I think we've got uh, a couple more, a um, couple more minutes. I still see there's 27 participants here. So, um, again, uh, there's a question from Car uh, Catherine. There will still uh, there will still be more gear retired on land. How do we facilitate commercially moving retired gear? Can BCE help that barrier? Sources of ghost gear is well documented. It's solutions to treat that what we have, and hopefully it will encourage the sector to utilize facilities. Um, so in terms of the um, circular economy project what we're able to do is provide one-to-one -one advice particularly to smes you know around the solution side so it has to come from an sme and particularly on the solutions and, and they have to be based within the the npa region so for example galway cork etc is in the region and there, in the back of the report, we have the eligible um, areas that that for support, and we're we're also um, open to suggestions about workshops and, and webinars uh, to take thinking forward. So I would suggest, in your instance, Catherine, you just go back to Stephen uh, with as our Irish partner, and um, and you know open a discussion. I'm sure he'd be happy to hear from you. So um, any other questions? So again, to expand on that, again, if you're in Norway or you're if in, um, a certain, in Iceland or certain parts of Finland or certain parts of Sweden, uh, in again, certain parts of Ireland and Scotland and, and Norway, you, you are eligible for this uh, for free support if you are an SME, the key thing is SMEs. Uh, but we are open to further discussion. We're hoping to follow up on the lessons learned we also um, um, achieved from the two workshops we organised in, in uh, Galway and Alison, and that's an area um, that, uh, uh, you know, Catherine, for example, we will back to you on as well. So, uh, so any further last minute questions or thoughts? Um, you know, last, last point. So, um, so I'd like to say thank you all very much for your attention. Um, I hope you found it useful. Again, um, please uh, leave any short comments if you found it useful anything that you really liked, any thought was missing, 
we do have our reports in there. Um, we are uh, um, always looking at any uh, comments to that report and uh, feedback on that report and uh, to you know make it if there are you know new things or, or points that are need to be uh, amended we we like to hear that feedback so um, so again uh, thank you all for your comments and your thoughts and uh, uh, I will uh, hear from you I hope again in the near future so thank you again um, and have a good evening So there was a question here on, for those of you still, so the, the recording will be available in due course. Uh, we are going through some uh, issues around recordings at the moment because of uh, issues to do with uh, Zoom at the moment. Um, but we hope to make that recording available either directly through our own website or through the project website. Um, over the next month or so. Again, I still see 20 people here. So thank you again. Any comments, thoughts, if you're still here, if you wish to, you know, please feel free to send um, or email me directly. That would be, you know, uh, happy to tackle those as long as they're short and not long so uh, okay everybody have a good evening bye